from the SiliconANGLE Media office in Boston, Massachusetts. It's The Cube. Now, here's your host, Dave Vellante. Special Cube Conversation, simplifying blockchain for developers. Remy Carpanito is here, he's the CEO of Espresso. Remy, thanks for coming in. Yeah, thanks for having me, Dave. Yeah, so you guys are in the seaport. We want to hear all the action that's going on there, but let's start with Espresso. Uh, CEO, founder or? Yep. or yeah, founder. founder. Yep. Um, not a co-founder, founder. Co-founder, co -founder. Co -founder. Yeah, okay, yeah, good. Yeah, co Just to clarify, with respect to your co-founders. Yeah, of course. Why did you guys start Espresso? Yeah, no, it, uh, it starts back kind of a, a little bit, a little while ago. Um, we originally wanted to kind of replace uh, our f first company was a company called Campus Tab. And we wanted to replace student identity with NFC chips and smartphones. And uh, it was a really cool concept back in 2010. Uh, but at the time, there's only one phone that had the technology capable of pulling this off. And uh, we built a prototype with that uh, smartphone. It was a Samsung phone at the time. And uh, we brought that around to a dozen plus colleges showing, hey, you could replace the student ID with a phone. You could just tap your phone to for attendance, for events, et cetera. And they loved it. But everyone had the same question, you know, when is the iPhone going to have the technology? And we were three years early. Uh, the iPhone didn't come up with NFC chips until 2013. And uh, we ended up pivoting into a mentoring platform uh, and scaled that company up to over 70 colleges across the country. Um, but ironically enough, uh, we came back to the same issue. Um, a lot of CIOs and CTOs want us to interface with their single sign-on servers, uh, which required us to support this legacy technology. Uh, so AJ and I spun back internally, AJ is our co-founder and CTO, uh, to identify how can we replace uh, identity again but instead of using hardware and smartphones, let's use the blockchain. And AJ was an early uh, Bitcoin adopter back in 2010, mining Bitcoin, uh, really uh, kind of passionate about the technology. And I started learning a little bit more about it and trying to find a way to incorporate blockchain technology into our student identity solution as a secondary offering for Campus Tap. What we quickly realized was that our front end engineering team um, was a little bit uh, underwater in terms of the uh, technical skill set needed to help and participate in the development for the blockchain identity solution. Uh, so we ended up building up some middleware components to help them with the development. And that's where we saw, kind of that's where the light bulb went off. Uh, and the bigger opportunity came about where a lot of the infrastructure and tooling needed in order to build a production level blockchain application isn't quite there yet. Uh, so we ended up pivoting and building a new company called Espresso. Uh, to make blockchain development more accessible. So let's talk about that, the, the challenge that your developers face. So yeah. you were at the time writing in, for Ethereum and in yep. Solidity, right? Yep. Which is, explain to our audience why that's so challenging. What is Solidity yeah. and, and why is it so complex? Yeah, Solidity is a JavaScript based uh, framework for writing smart contracts on the Ethereum platform. Um, it's not a fully baked uh, or fully developed um, uh, tools that yet uh, in terms of the language, there's some nuances. Um, but on top of that, you also need to understand how to support things like the infrastructure, so the cryptography, the network protocols. Um, so if you want to sustain your own blockchain, there's a lower level skill set needed. So the average JavaScript engineer could be a little bit kind of um, overwhelmed by what's needed to, to actually participate in the full blown blockchain development. Yeah, so there are probably close to 10 million JavaScript engineers worldwide. Yep. So it sounds like your strategy is to open up blockchain development to that massive you know, resource. Yeah, and, and JavaScript being a definitely a core focus out of the gates, and we'll be developing a plethora of SDKs, including JavaScript and Python and Ruby, et cetera. Um, and the thought process is, you know, activating these engineers that are coming out of new code academies or enterprise engineers that are really good at C++ or another language, um, and, and allowing them to code in the languages they already know and, and allow them to participate in the blockchain development itself. Okay, and so how many developers are on, on, on your team? So we have, it's a small uh, product team, there's three people on the product team now, but we're actually in the process of scaling that up quite a bit. Yeah, so those guys actually had to go yeah. <laughs> on the job training, so they kind of taught themselves, and, and then that's where you guys got the idea, said okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly, and, and we realized that, you know, if we could build out this infrastructure, this tooling layer that just allows you to compile the languages you know into the um, software or the blockchain side, it can make it much more accessible. And then also, the other thing too, that's interesting, it's not just kind of writing the languages they're already accustomed to, but it's also the way you architect these blockchain solutions. And one thing we've realized is that a lot of people think that you know every piece of data needs to live on the blockchain, where that's really not, it's not advantageous for you to do so, because it's really expensive to put all the data on the blockchain, and it's relatively slow right now with Ethereum and 30 transactions per second. There's companies like VeChain that are looking to remedy some of those solutions with faster 
uh, right data, right times. But the thought process is you can also create this data store. And with our middleware, it's not just uh, an SDK, but it's a side chain or a, a really performant in-memory based data store that will allow you to store off-chain data um, still in a secure fashion uh, through consensus, et cetera, um, that can allow you to write data rich or today's level applications on the blockchain, uh, which is really kind of the next step I see coming in, in the blockchain space. So I want to follow up on one, one question there. I mean, historically distributed database, which is what blockchain is, yeah. has been you know hard to scale. It's like you say, low transaction volume. So you had to pick the right use cases. Smart contracts is an obvious one. Yeah. Do you feel as though Blockchain eventually, you, you mentioned VeChain, it sounds like they're trying to solve that problem, will eventually get there to where it can, can compete with a more centralized model head on in some of you know, the more mainstream apps. Yeah, and that's, and that's kind of where we are because our thought process, if we were to move Campus Tap, a kind of a, a kind of private LinkedIn for colleges per se, mm -hmm. uh, onto the blockchain back when we started, it wouldn't be possible. Um, so how do you store this non-pertinent data, this transactional or um, not even transactional, this attribute data um, within a blockchain application? And that's really where that second layer solution comes into play. And you see things like Lightning Network for Bitcoin, et cetera, and Plasma for Ethereum. Um, but creating this environment where a developer comes on, they create an account, um, they name their application, they pick their software language, and then they pick their blockchain, this pre-built smart contract we offer them. But on top of that, they already have this data store that they can leverage. These are things that people are already accustomed to in the Web 2.0 world. Uh, these are the caching layers that everyone uses, things like Redis, et cetera, that we're bringing into the blockchain space that, will, I, that we believe will allow this kind of large scale consumer type application. Well, there. and when you think about blockchain, you think, okay, well, you think secure, yep. right? Um, but at the same time, if you're writing in Solidity and you're not familiar with it, the code could be exposed to inherent right. security flaws. Is that so? Do you see that as one of the problems that you're solving sort of by default? Yeah, I think one thing here is uh, kind of, as you write a smart contract, you need to audit it, you test it, uh, so on and so forth. And so we're helping kind of get that core scaffolding put up for the developer. So they don't need to start from scratch. They don't need to pull a vanilla uh, smart contract off of a open source library. They can leverage ones that are kind of uh, battle tested through our, through our internal infrastructure. So uh, the last part of our kind of offering is this marketplace of pre-developed components that developers can leverage to rapidly prototype or build their applications, whether it be a consumer, engineer, uh, or an enterprise level engineer. And, and are you a developer? Or what's your background? My background, yeah. So I uh, studied uh, entrepreneurship and information systems. Uh, so I do have, I, I was a uh, database analyst at Fidelity. It was my last job uh, in the corporate world. Um, so I do have some experience developing, nowhere near that of my co-founder, AJ, or some of our other engineers. But, um, but yeah, I understand the uh, core concepts pretty well. Well, and speaking of blockchain, which we're talking about obviously, we, you, you see a lot of mainstream companies, obviously the banks are all, all looking at it. Um, you're seeing companies, we just you know heard VMware making some noise the other day. Certainly IBM makes a lot of noise about smart contracts. So you're seeing some of these mainstream enterprise tech companies you know, you know, come into it. What do, what do you see there in terms of adoption in the mainstream? Yeah, no, I think the enterprise space is going to want to fully embrace this technology first. I think the consumer level, we're still a little bit ways away there, uh, just because this infrastructure and this tooling is needed before developers kind of get there. But from the enterprise space, what we see, I mean, obvious things like supply chain being a phenomenal use case of the blockchain technology, Walmart, IBM are already implementing really cool solutions. Uh, one of my advisors, uh, Rob Dolce, is the president of Azune. They've successfully implemented several blockchain projects from car parts manufacturers to track and trace through um, wine uh, seeds uh, and this from um, uh, grape seeds. And uh, so there's a lot of different use cases in the supply chain side. Identity is really exciting. Mm. Uh, Estonia is already doing some really cool work with digital identity, so that's going to have a big impact. Voting systems, et cetera. Um, but also thinking through uh, some newer concepts like video streaming and, and decentralization of uh, network maps. And so there's many different use cases. And for us, we're not trying to necessarily solve like a, the supply chain problem or anything. We're trying to give a set of tools that anyone can use for their vertical. So we're excited to see kind of what Espresso is used for in over the next several months to a year. Uh, Remy, you mentioned VeChain before. So yeah. explain what VeChain is and how you're, what you're doing with those guys. Yeah, so VeChain is a kind of next generation blockchain. Um, their uh, their VeChain Thor is the new platform. Actually, their mainnet launches uh, tomorrow. 
Um, and uh, they're really excited. They're introducing um, in heightened security, faster um, block times, more transactions per second. Uh, they have a really uh, interesting governance model that I think is a good ba balance be pure, between pure decentralization and the centralized world, which I think is that, that intermediate step that a lot of these enterprises are going to need to get to, into the blockchain space. Um, and we're working with them. We're launching on their platform. So uh, our token sale will be run through VeChain, uh, which is great. Um, in addition, we'll be um, working with them uh, with through strategic partnerships. And the goal is to have Espresso be the entry point for developers coming into VeChain. Um, so we'll help kind of navigate the waters and kind of have them leverage the pre-built smart contracts and get more developers into the ecosystem. Okay, let's talk about your token sales. So you're doing a sure. utility token. Yep. Um, and so that means you've actually got utility in the token. So how yep. is that utility token being utilized within your community? Yeah, so the, the, the data, um, the, actually the token is used to meter and mitigate abuse in the uh, platform as well. So it, every single transaction, it'll validate um, the transaction. Uh, in addition, it'll be an abstraction layer. Since we do speak to multiple blockchains, the easy peasy token will have to abstract out to Ethereum, to Thor, which is the VeChain token, the future, Dragon Chain, et cetera. Um, so that's a really interesting use case. And one of the interesting things we're trying to solve right now if you're a developer trying to come in and use a, a cryptocurrency for development, you need to go to something like a Coinbase, you have to exchange fiat to a, Ethereum, you have to push that out to a third party exchange, you have to do a trade, and then you have to send that digital wallet address uh, where you get easy peasy out to our account after. That's a ton of friction, mm -hmm. and that's more friction. If you're not a, a, a crypto person, you're going to be, what is, you're going to be asking. He's not going to do it. Yeah, <laughs> so we're, we're talking to some pretty big potential partners that allow uh, kind of, they would be the intermediary, intermediary or a money service to allow a seamless transition for an uh, engineer just to come straight onto Espresso, put down a credit card, bank account, uh, verify, go through the uh, standard KYC AML process, and then be able to get easy peasy in real time. And, and that's something that at a macro level, I think is one of the biggest barriers to entry in the blockchain space today. So w what do you call your, your token? Easy peasy. Easy, oh, beautiful, <laughs> I love it. Okay, so you're making that simple and yep. transparent. Now, so you're doing a, a, a utility token, you're doing a raise. Um, where are you at with that raise? Give us the details there. Yeah, yeah, so we just closed our uh, friends and family around. We're in our private sale right now, uh, working closely with the VeChain and VeChain Foundation, uh, helping kick that off right now as well. Um, and we're, yeah, this is going to be much more strategic capital in this round. Um, and then after that, uh, we'll be moving into, uh, since we are partnered with VeChain, their community gets a little bit of exclusivity in the next piece of the round. So their master node holders will get a, um, a bigger discount in the next round. And then the last round will be the public round for uh, the general community. And, and that's where we anticipate a lot of developers. We already have development shops coming on participating in the first round, uh, which is great because the thought process is, we want to get as many developers on this platform as possible throughout the summer. Um, and I think that's one of the most unique things about a token sale. It's, it's not just raising capital, um, it's actually getting people that want to use your product to buy in now. And that's, that's amazing. So, okay, so you're doing a, the private sale first, right? Yeah. And you open that up to those types of folks that you just mentioned, and they yeah. get some kind of discount on the, on the token because yeah. they're, they're in early and they're backing you guys early. Yeah. And then you guys get a telegr telegram channel. I know it was yeah. on the recently, I think it's exploding. So it's, <laughs> it looks like a pretty hot you know, uh, offering. Um, and then, then what happens next? Then you open it up to just a, a wider audience? Uh, yeah, how does so that work? The, the funnel starts to open up a bit and we start getting uh, the core community members from VeChain and then after that the public sale will be really targeted for the end users. Uh, these are the people that you don't need to put in a, large, a substantial amount of capital to get in at that point. You can put in a couple hundred dollars and actually participate uh, in, in the uh, token sale and well, you'd be getting on the kind of ground floor in a sense. And, and, and the SEC just made a ruling you know, recently, uh, a week ago or so, that, that, that Bitcoin and, and in, a, in Ethereum were not security, so that's yep. a good thing. Nonetheless, you as a CEO, an entrepreneur, you must have been concerned about yep. you know, a utility token, making sure everything's clean, that there actually is utility. You can't just use the utility token to do a raise and then go build the product. So right. you, had, you had it, you have a working product, correct? Yeah, so there's a lot of uh, functionality already stood up and we're going to continue to iterate before we even get close to the actual tokens or the public sale. Right. Um, so we anticipate having full functionality of what we want to get out there to the development world. Um, by the end of the sale. So it's uh, the thing that we, I think one of the biggest things in this space right now in terms of the uh, law and, and compliance side is a lot of self-regulation since in the U.S. in particular, it's such a gray area. Um, you need to, one, stay up to date with every single hearing and, and, and uh, announcement, um, but also really make sure you're, you're taking best practices with KYC AML, making sure that you know your people that are investing into the, um, or kind of participating in the allocation. 
And um, and that's something we you know we, we've spent a lot of time with our legal team. I've uh, gotten pretty intimate with our lawyers and really understanding kind of the nuances of this space over time. What about domicile? What can you advise people you know based on your experience in terms of domicile? Yeah, I'm not a lawyer, but uh, based on our experience, I mean, there's some great places over in, in Europe. Uh, you know, Switzerland, Malta, Gibraltar. Uh, we're down in the Cayman, um, and uh, also Singapore. Um, there's a, a you know these different um, legislate or jurisdictions are, are writing new law uh, to support the effort. And I think that's going to continue to happen, and I hope it ha happens in the U.S. too. So we remove some of this nuance and gray area so people can feel more comfortable operating. Um, and I think that's going to happen hopefully soon in the next six months or so. We'll see. Um, but as long as more guidance continues to come out, I think uh, we can operate, um, or people can operate in the U.S. I know a lot of people are moving offshore like, like we did. Um, so it's just something that's going to, it's a tough area right now. Well, it gives you greater flexibility. Yep. Um, and it, like you said, it's less opaque, so you can yep. have more confidence that what you're going to do is is on the up and up. Because as an entrepreneur, you don't, you, you, don't, you don't have to worry about compliance. You just want to do your job and, you and write great code and, right. and execute and build a company. And so, I mean, I feel, I don't know if, if you agree, that the U.S. is a little bit behind. Yep. You know, this, this kind of really slow to support entrepreneurs like yourselves, like, like us. We'd like more transparency and, and clarity and you just can't seem to get a decision. You're sort of in limbo and you got to move your business ahead. So you make a decision. You go right. to the Caymans, you go to Switzerland, you go to Malta yep. and then you move on. Right. So. And I think it's, it's interesting too. And you know, a lot of what the SEC did in the beginning, there's a ton of bad actors out there just as well. And there's a bunch of good actors too. So um, again, if you, if you self-regulate, you, uh, you really understand what you need to do to be compliant you should be fine. Uh, uh, but again, I think the flexibility you get right now with the more kind of uh, defined law in some of these other jurisdictions makes a lot of sense. Yeah, and I don't mean to be unfair to the SEC. They are doing a, a job and they need to protect the little guy right. and, and protect the innocent, no question. I would just like to see them be more proactive and provide more clarity sooner rather totally. than later. Totally. So, okay, um, last question. The seaport sure. scene in Boston, yeah. you know, we always compare Boston and Silicon, Silicon Valley. You can't compare the two. Silicon Valley is a vortex in and of itself. Yep. But the Boston scene's coming back. There's blockchain, there's IoT, the yeah. seaport is cranking. You guys are in the seaport, you live down there. What are you seeing? Give us a, yeah. what, what's the vibe like? Yeah, no, uh, blockchain we just passed about a month ago, um, it, maybe less, and uh, uh, great turnouts. Uh, I spoke at a few events, a few hundred people, kind of at each one, uh, which was great. And um, it's interesting, you get a good mix of enterprise people looking to learn and educate themselves in the space. You see the venture capital uh, side moving into the space and uh, participating in a lot of these larger scale events. And uh, it's definitely growing rapidly uh, in terms of the blockchain scene in Boston. And I uh, spent some time in New York and that's another great spot too. And, um, and even think places like Atlanta um, and I was down in Denver. I did a great big presentation down in Denver, which was awesome. And, and uh, the coolest thing about blockchain is it really is global. I spent a lot of time in Asia and in Europe. And speaking over there, the, the pure, at like the tangible energy in the room is, is amazing. And it's one of the most exciting things about the industry. Uh, many people that in, in this space know we're on the cutting edge here. Uh, we're on the, this is the new frontier that we're, we're building along the way. And uh, being part of that and helping define that is, is pretty exciting stuff. That's cool. You know, I, I said last question, I lied. <laughs> I, I forgot to ask you a little bit more about your your team. M sure. Maybe you could you talk a team, your team, your advisors. Maybe yeah, you yeah. could just give us a brief yeah, for overview sure. there. My co-founder and CTO. We've been working together since I believe my sophomore year of college. Um, so it's been a while, and uh, have, he's their original crypto uh, blockchain guy, and um, and pushed us into this space. He's leading kind of the product development on that front. Uh, and in, on top of that, we have Craig Gainsborough, our CFO. Mm -hmm. uh, I actually spent a lot of time at PwC. He was the North America Tax and Advisory CFO over there. Um, we have Jylan Liu, who's the Director of uh, Product Marketing. Uh, Kevin Kutu is the Head of Product. Um, he worked, I think he was nominated for Webby. Um, and then we have our ops team, uh, Kyle, who's a former Campus Tab employee, lead, lead business dev guy over there that's working on us. From um, some of the other side, on the advisory team, we have a really good uh, team. Sonny Liu from the CEO and founder of VeChain just came on. Uh, Eileen Quenin, the president of Dragon Chain Foundation, uh, that was the blockchain company that spun out of Disney. Um, and then David Fergale is the co-founder and had a product of Autonomy. Uh, it's an IoT protocol. Really, really cool stuff happening over there. New, new, new program coming about. Uh, Rob Dolce is the president uh, of Asian North America, which is a supply chain company, and they've already successfully deployed a handful of use cases. And Mihaila, Dr. Mihaila Uliru, 
who um, is really interesting in, in the sense that she was working on decentralized systems before they were called blockchain. Uh, she worked with a professor in Berkeley that defined decentralized uh, in, uh, technology. And um, she speaks in the World Economic Forum frequently and um, is really just a global presenter. Uh, so uh, we, have a, we feel like we have a really strong team right now. Um, and uh, we're actually getting to the point of scaling. So it's going to be exciting to start bringing in some new people and uh, picking up the momentum. It's super exciting. Well, listen, congratulations on getting to where, where you are and best of luck going forward. Best of luck with the raise and, and solving the problem that you're solving. It's, a, it's an important one. And thanks for coming on theCUBE. Yeah, of course. Thank you so much. Appreciate you're, it. You're welcome. All right. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time. This is Dave Vellante.